Number 23, letter A. What is the pressure drop due to the Bernoulli effect as water goes into a three centimeter diameter nozzle uh, from a nine centimeter diameter fire hose while carrying a flow of 40 liters per second? Um, all right, so we are tasked to find the pressure drop and we have a certain flow rate, right? 40 liters per second. Uh, we have certain diameters, all right? The diameter of the, of the hose was uh, nine centimeters. I converted that to meters already. Of the nozzle, it was three centimeters. I converted that to meters down here. And while we're at it, we know we're probably not gonna need the diameter, right? We probably need the radius. So let's just, instead of writing an equal sign here, just divide this, all of these by two. Okay, divide this by two, divide this by two, so we can find the radius, all right? So we can say R1 then will be equal to 0 0.045, and then R2 here will be equal to 0 0.015. All right, these are both in meters. Another thing I noticed, right, is my Q it has liter per second. We know that we have to convert that to cubic meter per second. Um, we know that that's the only unit we gotta convert basically liter to cubic meter. And therefore converting that, I've done it many times before, um, we would just have to take this value divided by 1000. All right, so this now will become uh, 0 0.04, forget the sig figs, meter cubed per second. All right, I'll try to remember the sig figs at the end, just too many zeros to write. So, um, all right, so now we have all the right units and now we have to, now we can actually approach the problem, right? So if you notice, before I even start really calculating stuff, I'm making sure I got all the units uh, in the right, um, uh, oh, all of the correct units, there we go. So we gotta find the pressure drop, okay? So we're, we're trying to relate, um, basically the idea here is that the velocity of flow will be different. The Q is constant, all right, the volume flow rate, right, but the velocity is different. So the velocity uh, flowing through the nozzle up here will be faster than the uh, velocity flowing through the hose down here. Why is that the case? Take a look at this formula. Right, Q is equal to AV, cross-sectional area, velocity, volume flow rate. So as the area goes up, meaning when I compare D1 to D2, the cross-sectional area here is greater than it is here. And therefore, if A goes up, V will go down because I know Q has remained constant. All right. Why is that the case? Well, that's the uh, conservation of, of mass flow. Okay. Now... This being the case, I know that, you know, I can do this in a couple of ways, right? I can first find the velocities in here and then probably going to have to substitute it into Bernoulli's equation. I'm actually going to just start off with Bernoulli's equation down here and then we'll work from there. All right. I want to find the pressure drop. Now, uh, remember that where there is faster velocity, there is lower pressure. Okay. So higher, I'll, I'll write this higher V, lower P. So up here, we would experience less pressure. Now, I know this is counterintuitive. On the last video, I kind of made a simple explanation. Think of if you had a balloon and you filled the balloon up with air, right? You would have a lot of pressure inside of this balloon, but essentially no net velocity, right? I know the particles are moving around, but they're all going to cancel, right? All the directions. So there's no net velocity, but there is a lot of pressure. Consider the pressure like potential energy, all right? So for example, if now I were to cut a hole, let's say in the balloon, right? What happens to the velocity of the air in here? It's going to go up, right? The, the velocity, the air is going to move out. And the velocity of the air has now gone up. Okay, that's easy to understand. How about what happens to the pressure inside the balloon? Well, it kind of deflates, right? Not kind of, it does deflate. And the pressure will go down. So there's your relationship, all right? In other, in other words, you converted potential energy of pressure into kinetic energy, all right, so that should hopefully that should hopefully make it make a little more sense. So, although I know we're not dealing with a balloon here, but it's very easy to understand uh, with the balloon analogy. I feel, but same principles will apply. Faster flow here, that energy, right? That energy, the, because the particles are moving faster, that increase in kinetic energy had to come from somewhere, right? There was no net external pressure applied to this thing to increase or whatever, right? I'm not like heating it up or anything like that. There's no increase in pressure that way. So where is, uh, so excuse me, energy I meant to say. So where is the increase in kinetic energy coming from? Well, it's coming from the increased pressure down here. So the pressure up here is lower. All right. Now, 
we're trying to find the uh, pressure drop. So we can now say that, let me, let me write this. So P2 should be lower, right, or less than P1, okay? Because the rate, the, vo uh, the velocity is faster up here. So if the velocity is faster at the second point, the pressure will be lower. All right. Now that being the case, I know that, um, so now, uh, okay. So now let's go down to the equation down here. All right. What did I just do? Okay. So now, is there anything I can cancel from this equation as I start to, as I start to calculate? Well, I'm going to assume that there's really no change in height, all right, of the two locations. I mean, you might look at my picture and, well, there's an apparent change in height. Yeah, but I'm blowing it up because, you know, we got to, if I made it so minuscule, then we're not going to see anything. Plus, they don't give me any height, so I don't even know what the height would be, right? So we can't assume as height. We got to get rid of it. So that goes away. So basically now what I'm left with is P1. Let me put this in black. Uh, P1 plus one half rho of the water, because we're talking about water. V1 squared is equal to P2 plus one half rho of the water times V2 squared. Now, just like in all other problems where we had to choose a reference point, like for a height, okay? So if you have a certain cliff, you're going to throw the rock off. Let's say this is, I don't know, you know, 70 meters. And you chose your coordinate system to originate at the top. This value of 70 meters is negative 70. And this starting point would be zero. Correct? Or if you chose to frame the problem down here with your axes at the bottom, this value now becomes a positive 70, and this location is now the zero value. So if you notice, it depends on what I want to call zero. The signs will change, but the mechanics and the physics of it does not. So what I need to do here is I need to choose my zero point. Why? Because they're asking me for the pressure drop. Okay? So if I'm trying to find the pressure drop, essentially I'm trying to find the change in pressure. Okay? From P1 to P2. Now, that being the case, I can simplify. I mean, I can plug in the changes. I can do all this, right? I mean, I could also just solve for change in pressure, too. I mean, that might be easier if you want to think about it just purely algebraically, right? Change in pressure. Um, if you want to find the pressure drop, uh, it would be, right? Remember, we said P1 will be greater than P2. So to find the pressure drop, it would be P1 minus, uh, no, excuse me, actually. It would be P2 minus P1, right? This would give you the pressure drop. For example, if pressure 2 were 5 and pressure 1 were 12, then you know the pressure drop was negative 7, and that should kind of make sense. It's lower. It's negative. Okay? So you can, you can algebraically do this if you wanted, okay, by solving this equation for um, P2 minus P1. I'm fine with that. That would be great to do, all right? And actually, maybe that's the way we'll do this problem, because on the last problem... Number 22, I chose to use a zero value in my equation. That might be easier for some people to see, but I'm going to do this a different way. The zero value technique was choose one of these locations, meaning choose one of these pressures to be your zero value. Now, it would make sense if you chose your P1 to be zero because you're trying to find the pressure drop uh, when the velocity of flow is faster, meaning at the second location. So if you you know, if P1 is zero, that cancels, and basically you're solving for P2. And what you'll realize is that we're going to come up with the same answer if you use that technique versus this technique. But I'm going to use this one on this problem. All right, enough talking. Let's get to it. So uh, subtract P1 from this side on over, right? And simultaneously, then, I want to get this variable on over to the left-hand side. So it's just subtract. I'm just going to write this. Just subtract that on over, okay? So now we're going to have on the, it doesn't matter how I organize this, I'm gonna put this though on the left-hand side and then this on the right-hand side. So this is P1, excuse me, P2 minus P1. The reason why I do this is because usually the, right, the, what we're solving for is on the left. This is just convention. It doesn't matter. You can obviously uh, put it any side you like. This will then be equal to one half uh, density of the water times V1 squared minus then one half density of the water times V2 squared. Now, just to, Simplify the calculations a little bit. I'm going to pull out a common one-half density of the water, right? So one-half rho w times now v1 squared minus v2 squared. And here's the formula. This is it. This is the pressure drop formula. All right, so now plugging that in, we're going to have p2 minus p1 is equal to one-half multiplied by the uh, density of water times now uh, v1 uh, now that's the thing, right? We don't know V1, and that's okay. But what do we know about uh, 
What do we know about the items at V1? Well, we do know that the, we do know the area, right? And we do know the volume flow rate. So I can use this equation to substitute in volume flow rate and area. For example, Q is equal to AV. Solve that for V, we get Q over A. Okay, now I know this, they told that to me, it's 40.04 uh, uh, cubic meters per second, and the area, how would I calculate the area? Well, it's a cylinder, so I know that it's going to be pi r squared. Uh, let's plug in that V, we have now uh, Q all over pi r, uh, this will be one squared. Now remember this whole term is squared. Okay, minus then, we have now Q again, all divided by pi, pi r2 squared. And this whole thing is squared again, close those brackets. Now I'm sure you can simplify this even further, but I'm not going to, I'm just going to calculate right away. I'm going to plug in the numbers, okay? So P2 minus P1 will be equal to one half times the density of the water. We're assuming it's fresh water, so it's a thousand. Multiply by now 0 0.04, oops. 0 0.04, that's the Q, divided by now pi times R1, which is 0 0.045, 0 0.045, square that, and then square that whole result, minus then 0 0.04, all divided by pi R2 now, which is 0 0.015, squared, and then square that whole result. And now we should get our answer. So let's throw this into the calculator. So let's do that, uh, so let's see. So now we're gonna have 0 0.04 divided by now, pi times 0 0.045 squared. And that whole value is squared. And then do the second value. So this is gonna be 0 0.04 divided by parenthesis pi uh, times then 0 0.015 squared. Square that result. And then take the original and then subtract that from the value we just got. So inside those brackets, I got a negative 3,000 or so, all right? Then take that and multiply it by now 1,000, and then multiply it by 0.5. So here we go. So now here is our, oops, here is our change in pressure. So we have negative 1.58, 1.58 times 10 raised, times 10 raised to the, ne uh, no, to the positive three, looks like six, right? Times 10 raised to the sixth. And that is in terms of Pascal. Those are the units I'm gonna leave it in. You can convert it if you like, but you know, you can do whatever you want there. So that is the answer for part A. All right, that is, whoops, that is part A. All right, so now let's take a look at part B. So to what maximum height above the nozzle can this water rise? All right, so now there are several ways to do this, this part. Please check out, I think it's number 20. I, I did a problem identical to this basically, and I talked about two ways how to solve it, all right? And I went into a lot of detail. I'm gonna go into some detail here, but probably not as much as that. In order to solve this problem, I'm gonna to choose to use Bernoulli's equation down here to help me solve. All right, so let me just erase this. All right, let me use Bernoulli's equation. So now, let's go to the picture, all right, first, and uh, realize that you know the water's gonna be coming out of this hose, right? It's gonna reach some maximum height. All right, so I know that I have two points of interest here. So you, you notice Bernoulli's equation takes two points of interest into account. So I'm going to, I so I have two points of interest too. This point at the top, I'll call that, uh, I'll call that my first point. The reason why is because I already have this labeled too. So let's not change that. Let's just label this the second point. All right. Now, the important assumption that I'm going to be making here is I'm going to be making, I'm going to be looking at the frame of this problem right after the water leaves this nozzle, okay? Right after the water leaves, okay? That's the point I'm going to be uh, talking about. Not the point just before it leaves, but the point just after it leaves. Why? Well, uh, I know that the velocity just before it leaves, so two things, I know the velocity just before it leaves will be almost the same as the velocity just after it leaves, right? I'm talking about like the nanosecond, okay? Even probably less, a picosecond. All right, uh, after the water leaves this tube. So the velocity is virtually gonna be the same. But the reason why I'm gonna look at the problem just after the water leaves the tube is because once the water leaves the tube here, or the nozzle, it is under atmospheric pressure. 
okay? It's not experiencing now the pressure due to the uh, nozzle. It's experiencing now atmospheric pressure, okay? And the water at the top here is also experiencing what? It's also experiencing atmospheric pressure. Remember the P's here stand for, it can stand for the absolute pressure, okay? Now you might say, well, wait a minute, it depends on the height that this thing goes up, right? Doesn't atmospheric pressure go down, right? Isn't it reduced the higher you go up away from the center of the earth? And yes, you are right, all right? However, though, we're gonna, we're gonna make a simplifying assumption here that it stays the same. Uh, will it stay the same? No. How much will it change? Minuscule. Okay, it won't really impact the numbers here, but there is a change. So that being the case that I know the pressure at the first point, P1, is basically the same as the pressure of the second point just after that water leaves the hose, I can go down to my formula, cross those out. All right. Now, just like we've done all types of kinematics problems, right, we have to choose what would be good is for us to choose a, a reference point of zero. All right. So here, I'm going to choose this to be my zero reference point in terms of the height, right? In terms of how to calculate the height here, remember, we could either frame the coordinate system at the top, we could frame it at the bottom here. It doesn't matter. The numbers will be magnitudes the same, but they would have opposite signs. Uh, what I'm going to do here is I'm going to take this to be my reference value of zero. So knowing that my height here, basically this is H2, would be equal to zero, I go back to my formula and I look, oh, H2 zero, so that whole thing cancels. Now up here, I'm calling this H1. So that's really what I'm interested in, right? If I can find H1, that's really going to be the total height here. You could have also found the delta H, just like we've done delta P down here. There's a whole bunch of ways to look at these problems, but you're gonna get the same answer, all right? Um, now, so actually, exactly what I'm doing here where I chose my zero reference point is exactly what I was saying before that we can do here for the pressure. It's the same idea. Instead, though, I decided to choose, for, uh, decided to solve for the delta p, and in this case, I'm just choosing my zero point. But you can do either method. We're going to get the same result. All right. Now we also know one other thing. You know that this water coming out of the tube here has some velocity, right? It has some velocity. How do we find that velocity? Well, remember I said it's going to be equal to the velocity just before it leaves the tube. So you know that this tube has a certain diameter, aka radius. And you also know that there's a certain volume flow rate, so we're probably gonna be using this equation, oops, this equation over here on the right-hand side. Oh, wait a minute, look, I already solved that, right? I already did that work. Okay, so just keep that in mind. And what's the velocity here at the top? What's the Y component at least? That we can know for sure, right? What's the Y component? It's zero, that you gotta know, guys. Anytime something reaches its highest point, you gotta know that it's zero velocity in the Y direction. All right, I'm assuming this thing's pointing straight up and therefore the overall velocity is zero for that fraction, for that fraction of a second in time, right, when the water is just, just reaches the top point. But now that I know that this, remember, this is my one value, so I know my velocity V1 is gonna be zero, so I can go down here and cancel that. And look what we're left with now, right? Look what we're left with. We are left with density of the water times gravity times H1 is equal to one half density of the water times V2 squared. Doesn't this look eerily similar to energy, right? Energy calculation. Doesn't this look like? Doesn't this look like potential energy? Doesn't this kind of look like kinetic energy, right? If you think about the formulas, doesn't? Isn't this kind of saying that all of the kinetic energy initially? I just chose that to be 0.2 as my initial point, but doesn't this look like all of the initial kinetic energy is going to equal all of the final potential energy, or all of the kinetic was converted into potential? Yeah, that's exactly right. So this should look very familiar now. Now notice the densities will cancel just like the mass is canceled, all right, in the energy calculations. And this is where having a good understanding of the prior chapters comes into play, all right? Now energy is definitely related to this. There's no coincidence that this formula looks so similar to the energy calculations. But that's why you wanna have a good understanding of all the prior concepts. Kinematics, forces, and energy. Those are the three big ones, all right? Um, so here, Solve this now, remember, the variable of interest is H1. So now solve this for H1, so we get V2 squared all over G. Well, don't forget the half, just seeing if you're still awake, uh, divided by G. Now, this is good, this is the formula. However, though, we don't know V2, but remember, I just mentioned before that this is the velocity formula that relates volume, flow rate, and radius. So what I'm gonna do now is I'm going to plug in this for my V, okay? So this is gonna be Q 
divided by pi times r. Now remember, this is r. Um, uh, this is r two. All right, this is r two. That's squared. Square that whole thing, and then divide it by g. So this is the formula. All right. So now what I'm going to do, I'm going to do the calculations up here. All right, so let's do that. So now we have H1 will equal 1 half times now Q, 0 0.04 divided by pi times then that radius of 0 0.015 squared. Square that whole thing divided by G, 9.8. And voila, we have the calculator. And now we just have to calculate. So 0.5 times, actually I'll solve in the parentheses first. So 0 0.04 divided by then pi times 0 0.015 squared. And then square that, then multiply that by 0.5. So the numerator value get about 1600, then divide that by 9.8. And here we go, 163. So 163 meters, okay? That will be the height it obtains. That's the value of H1. And then it says something like the actual height will be significantly less, of course, right? All these values, all these calculations, unless they state explicitly what the written resistance is and so on and so forth, we assume that there isn't any. But yes, um, the height will not be 163. Technically, it'll be less, but we can't calculate that. We have to calculate it without air resistance, all right? All right. So guys, thank you uh, very much for tuning in. I really do hope this helps, okay? I'm really... Um, trying to put everything I can think of on this piece of paper, as you can see. Well, actually, if this is all I can think of, I don't know much. But, um, you know, hopefully hopefully, I'm taking enough time to develop the ideas, all right? I know the videos uh, can sometimes be a little longer, but the reason why is because I'm really trying to have you guys understand it. Sometimes you cannot explain this. Con actually, I could have just chosen the equations, just thrown it in and calculated it. But I'm really trying to teach you something, all right? So... I appreciate it very much that you do take the time to view the videos. I promise you, if you watch these videos, you will do very well in the class. All right. And uh, yeah, so thanks so much. If it has helped, please subscribe. All right. Please tell your friends too. That would mean the world to us. And uh, we look forward to helping you with more questions. Take care.